Orchestral songs is quite a departure from Evening Train. How did this project come about? I did my first orchestration in 1996 for a, for a full orchestra. When you're starting out, you're conservative. You write, you know, you write knowing what will sound solid. Um, and you know, in that case, I was writing an orchestration for Pavarotti, uh, a Pavarotti and Friends thing. Um, that Tough I got. way to start, I yeah, think. Yeah, kind of odd. Uh, but it was actually one of his benefit concerts, pop musicians, so it wasn't like I'm, you know, I was working for Claudio Abbado and Pavarotti writing up some modern piece. <laughs> Starting that year, um, I had written a song for my wife, and a friend of mine had a couple of guys he'd gone to school with at University of Miami, a guy named Jeff Kivett, and he said, why don't we do that song that you wrote for your wife, why don't you orchestrate it, and we'll record it as a, as a Christmas gift for her. This is Want You this Miss is, You Love this You? This is Want You Miss You Love You, which is my least favorite, I think it's a nice song, it's my least favorite from an orchestration standpoint on the record. I just put it on there because Tammy loves it and it was the first. And so we, we planned this. I told Tammy I was going down to Miami to work with this new artist. And I went down and we did that song. And it was a great experience because it was for me and I was able to experiment. And it was a better orchestration than the Pavarotti stuff. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I can actually do projects of my own, songs of my own, to learn this game and to get better and better and better at it and try things. How did you decide to set poetry to music? A number of years ago, when I started really listening to the guys that are, you know, forever be my heroes, uh, Bernstein, um, Mahler especially, Britton, their, their individual songs were so striking musically and yet short that I realized that was a form I wanted to work in. And a number of years ago, I wrote three songs for Tammy. I wrote them for piano and voice, but they stuck with me. They were so interesting that I thought, you know, I should orchestrate those one day. Had I the heavens embroidered back to orchestrate them to complete this project to make them part of this orchestral songs thing I decided to write more settings of poetry and essentially my inspiration for settings of poetry are my are the great gods of my life musically Gustav Mahler and Benjamin Britten and uh, you know impossible standards <laughs> you know. what was your creative process for setting these poems to music you know, it's interesting, I worried about it because I'm a, n a novice in a way. I mean, I, I wanted to go study a little bit of the American composer, Ned Roram. Because you imagine there are laws, certain like assumed things. If you're going to set a poem, you know, you, you set it as if it's sacred, right? Nothing's going to be greater than the poem. Th these are classic poems. I mean, the poems on this project are by Heinrich Heine, the great German poet. Three by William Butler Yeats, you know, the greatest Irish poet ever, and the remaining one is by William Carlos Williams. I would never change a word. However, as a musician, what I respond to is the sound of words, you know, sweep the house clean, hang fresh curtains in the windows, uh, you know, um, 
just the, the phrase, sweep the house clean, uh, uh, even in um, the Yeats poem, had I the heavens embroidered cloths. You know, phrases like that are so rich. I'll double back on the phrases and utilize the poem in a way where I treat it almost like I'm setting a lyric and I'm, th this is an immortal poet, so I'm respectful of what he's written, um, but I'm never gonna beat that poem. Who shall hear of us in the time to come? Let him say, let him say, let him say that there was a burst of fragrance. There was a burst of fragrance. Fragrance from. You know, in the poem, this is a burst of fragrance from Black Branches. <laughs> you know, but what a great phrase. So I just wanted to milk it. And also, one of the things I do is I have all these volumes of poetry. I mean, I collect, I mean, I have hundreds of volumes of poetry. And I will look. And I will look for shorter poems. Um, and poems that immediately seem to want to be set to music or, or music of mine you know i was i had the great privilege of working with paul muldoon who's a you know pulitzer prize winning poet his poetry is very bawdy and interesting and i don't think i'm actually a particularly good match for his poetry and we don't write anymore but um i told paul you know you're talking to one of the you know paul will be mem you know remembered as one of the great irish poets of this the last century and this century. And I remember telling him, you know, I'm working with Paul Muldoon. No one will ever know about me in 40 years. They'll know about you. But you have to understand, you'll send me things and I won't be able to set them to music. And it's not because of you. It's not because you haven't sent me something great. It's just because I'm not going to dare touch your words unless I know I can hear it in my head that there's something there that I can bring something to. And each one of these poems were, was obvious. Like when I read Sweep the House Clean, it was just as if someone took the book and just went, yeah, freak. You know, I mean, it was like instant. I said, I have to set that. When You Are Old by Yeats. I almost didn't touch that because it's one of the most famous poems ever. And bending down beside the glowing bar Murmur a little sadly. The inside of the CD jacket has a picture of Studio One at Abbey Road. It's obviously a very special place for you. Why is that? It, I will never, ever forget the first moment I lowered the baton in that room. I was writing a, a chart for a gospel record. In, um, I just remember the same, same year that Saving Private Ryan was released, whatever year that was, because I remember the producer and I were going to go see that over there. And I, I put the baton down and heard the sound in that room, and it was like, oh, my Lord in heaven. I mean, I could not believe the sound. It was so glorious. It had this warm glow around it. So when I knew I wanted to complete this, complete this set of songs, uh, you know, my journey as an orchestrator and as a writer for orchestra, I said, I really want to finish it if I can at Abbey Road. The musicians are the musicians I use every time I'm over there. And, and those players, you know, there's English string tradition of playing Elgar. The London, I mean, there's something about it. There's something about those players, they're a family now. You know, they're my, one of my second family, so. Rob Mathis. Rob has um, two rooms, which he absolutely thinks are heaven sent and his favorite spaces of all time. The first is his uh, honeymoon suite, and the second is Abbey Road Studios, Studio One. Can we see the floor from there, Rich? No. Rolling. Here indeed is Studio One. Abbey Road Studios. There we are. 
designed in 1931, opened by Elgar, worked in by countless artists over the ages. What makes it special and why Rob gets it is because it just makes music breathe and it makes the musicians breathe and it makes the aim of the composer. Um, uh, the aim of the composer is met by the sounds that it creates. I feel extremely lucky to work at Abbey Road and have done since, since I joined and it's someone like Rob Mathis who actually keeps you going because it's actually the enthusiasm um, behind the music and beside that it's just the sheer volume of talent that someone like that can bring and when they arrive and have presence as well I think that's a very very special ingredient talent, presence and musical ideas that will exceed and stay around for a long long time and I think orchestral songs should be on everybody's Christmas list Beautiful. Can we get that, Jonathan?